okay, so look, ev welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, this towards work and, and open doors session. Um, delighted to to welcome Professor Thomas Cooney from Technical University Dublin, um, who's here to to speak to us all about the uh, Entrepreneurship for People with Disabilities program, which is run by by TU Dublin, supported by AIB and and Open Doors. Um, this course is in I believe in its third year, um, and is run for anyone who self identifies as having a disability and wishes to start a business of their own and is interested in the area of entrepreneurship. So throughout the, for today's session, we're gonna have Professor Cooney speak to us about the course. So we'll have some more information and details about what's, what's involved in it. Um, at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A as well. Um, you'll see hopefully on your screen is a Q&A section, um, the chat section where you can input questions feel free to input questions throughout the session um, if they if we feel we can or if, if professor cooney wishes to address them at the time um, you're more than welcome to do that um, or else we can wait to the end of the session and uh, we'll, we'll respond to as many as we can then at the end of the session also if you prefer we will you can raise your hand and we will give you the the uh, the, the, the opportunity to sort of speak directly to, to ask the question in the in the Q&A, but for the purposes of the talk and, and during the presentation, we'll keep that feature turned off. Um, so without further ado, I suppose we'll, I'll say thank you all again for, for joining us. Or just to say as well, sorry, this session is being recorded. Um, now, nobody is is visible on the screen, just your, your names are, are up on the on the side. So um, there, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, but if anybody does have any, any queries or any issues with regards to the, the recording at the end of the session, just to get in touch with me, Patrick at opendoorsinitiative.ie, and we'll be able to um, we'll be able to edit out anything that um, anything that there's an issue with. So um, thank you again, and Professor Cooney, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick, and uh, delighted to be with everyone this afternoon, uh, particularly given that it's a sunny day outside and you know, we're indoors. Um, this is a great opportunity for people to learn more about the forthcoming course on entrepreneurship for people with disabilities. And it's a customized course that has been designed specifically for the needs of people with disabilities. And I'll talk some more about that shortly. Uh, I'd like to thank AIB for their continued sponsorship and uh, Open Doors Initiative. Uh, who were co-founders of this uh, initiative in 2021. Um, so we ran a pilot in 2021. And then last year, AIB came on board. And so we ran it in 22 and we're running again this year and next year, definitely. Hopefully it will run beyond those dates also. Um, I'm going to share the screen now and share my presentation with you so that you can see what I'm seeing and I'll talk you through it. And as Patrick says, uh, feel free to ask questions via the chat room uh, as we go through it, or alternatively, you can uh, ask questions at the end. Happy to take any questions that you might have. So um, I am yeah, okay. So the area I specialize in is in inclusive entrepreneurship. And I work with people, particularly from uh, marginalized and disadvantaged communities, uh, to support them in terms of self employment as a career option. The communities we work with include immigrants. Um, we've done a big project at the moment for the European Union. Um, for prison education, um, also work with marginalized youth, um, seniors, travelers, um, women on occasion, because well, women are not a minority um, in terms of entrepreneurial representation, um, they're certainly underrepresented. And the argument that we make is that people from these communities face additional and distinctive challenges that the general population do not experience. 
And unfortunately, both policymakers and enterprise support agencies fail to recognize or appreciate these additional and distinctive challenges. And right now, this course that we are providing is the only customized program of its kind in this country. Uh, and that's a real disappointment that we should be so unique um, when really our preference would be that we would be part of a broader ecosystem of supports, tailored supports for people with disability. Here is a photograph from the most recent group. Now there's only seven people there. Um, in the photograph of, there's a photograph of eight people, one of which is the Minister for Disability and Rabbit, who is a constant supporter of our work. Uh, and and uh, attended the Dragon's Den event in AIB at the end of um, January last. And that was a very successful event where not only was there a Dragon's Den, but there was also a, a presentation of certificates for those people who had completed the course. Uh, there was 20 people started the course and, and stayed with us right through the whole uh, 12 weeks. But some people chose not to submit assignments and therefore could not graduate with the five ECTS credits. Uh, my recollection is that 13 of the 20 graduated, um, but only seven were able to attend on the day. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of background. Now, there's new stats out, but we're still waiting for the breakdown of them. And But according to the census of 2016, there are 643,131 people in Ireland with a disability which effectively amounts to 13.5% of the population. I did see in a recent newspaper article where the estimation is now that the population um, with some form of disability is approximately 14%, so it's a little higher according to the 2022 state census. What we also know from the 2016 census is that <clears throat> Approximately one third of the working age people with disability, that's people aged between 16 and 64, are actually employed. <coughs> Excuse me. And a recent report uh, from Europe highlighted that Ireland has the lowest employment rate for people with disability in the European Union. Now, that's a shocking statistic. And also, um, it should be noted that not only do people with disability have great difficulty in securing employment, but also the rate of pay for people with disability is uh, equally shocking. And both, are, both need to be addressed. Uh, and I know that we have a comprehensive employment strategy for people with disability, but obviously that ain't working in the way that it was intended to work. However, in all of this conversation, the notion of self-employment rarely gets mentioned. It should also be noted that the COVID pandemic had a disproportionate effect on people with disability in employment. Um, people with disability were more likely to become unemployed than the general population. And we know from the economic crisis of 2008 to 2012, <clears throat> that when people with disability were made unemployed, it took them longer to get back into the labour market than the general population. So not only are people from the community more likely to become employed, but they're going to have greater difficulty in getting back into the labour market. Some of the reasons for that include the fact that people with disability are more likely to have lower levels of education uh, and because of their inability to secure jobs, because of the additional costs that they endure because of their disability, they are more likely to experience poverty and 
social exclusion. However, it should be noted that just over 17,500 people are self-employed, sorry, just over 17,500 people with disability are self-employed and have employees, while almost 55,000, sorry, while almost 35,000 people with disability are self-employed and have no employees. So there is a strong cohort of people from the community um, who are self-employed in Ireland. Uh, and as you can see, about two thirds of them have no employees and one third approximately do have employees. So that's kind of a general background in terms of why this program is needed. Okay, so as I say, the opportunity to get a job is quite difficult. And there's no customized or tailored training available for people. And even I would argue that when you know, the conversation around what type of career a person should have, self-employment is rarely mentioned as a career option. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to change that conversation. We're trying to create greater awareness of the possibility of self-employment for people with disability. And fortunately, uh, in April, we were featured on RTE Nationwide, uh, where the course uh, and what we we're seeking to achieve was given its 15 minutes of fame. Uh, and the reaction to that particular piece was very positive. What are the motivations for self-employment for people with disability? Well, for some, it's a desire to overcome disability. Uh, indeed, many people, many entrepreneurs with disabilities that we would talk to do not reference themselves as entrepreneurs with disability, but rather reference themselves as entrepreneurs, nothing more. And, uh, and that you, their disability is just a, another characteristic and uh, within their total makeup. Uh, motivation for self-employment includes the inability to secure or to retain a job or a wish to increase income because as I previously mentioned um, rates of pay for people with disability is shocking in this country. Another motivation for self-employment and particularly in an age where assistive technologies, where IT platforms, where broadband accessibility is now much wider than any time in our history, that it allows greater flexibility in terms of working hours and workload. People can work from home now, uh, work from remote locations, obviously much more easy than any time in the past. And indeed, the pandemic has proven that working from home uh, is, is, is possible. The other kind of issue around that is that if people have medical appointments, it allows them okay, that flexibility in terms of their working day, maybe start earlier or finish later and take time out during the day to meet their um, medical appointments. Also, one of the benefits of remote working is that you know, transport or accessibility to one's workplace is no longer an issue if you're working from home. Another motivation is rebuilding of self-esteem. And indeed, one of the most positive outcomes from our courses so far that we hadn't anticipated was that people who took the course almost all said that even if they weren't to start their own business, they felt much more confident now about getting a job. They felt that they had a greater sense of self-emancipation and empowerment than they would have experienced prior to starting the course. So even 
if they weren't to start a business, they felt they were more likely to secure a job. And that was a positive outcome that we hadn't anticipated. Another motivation for self-employment includes the fact that it might suit or accommodate a person's disability. And that would include, for example, that there may be days or indeed weeks where people may be unable to work. And if they're self-employed, then you know, they can manage their work affairs more easier than if they were uh, employed by someone who doesn't appreciate or recognize their you know, distinctive needs. And a final motivation is <clears throat> due to discrimination or fear of discrimination in the workplace. And uh, people are frequently um, subject to various forms of discrimination and they wish to move away from such environments and instead operate in an environment that either they can control or one that's much more positive about their skill sets and what they can offer to an organization. However, one of the things that we do with the course is that we're very honest about the challenges and the difficulties in terms of self-employment for people with disability. We don't sugarcoat it. Uh, <clears throat> there are 20 people on the course each year and we do not expect everyone to start the business. Indeed, that's not what our ambition is. Our ambition is to give people a positive and supportive environment that allows them to assess the viability of their business idea. However, if at the end of the assessment process, you know, the, 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 the business idea is not viable, then, you know, we will say that. Uh, like a bad business idea is a bad business idea. It doesn't matter what your background might be. And so we would not advocate anyone starting a business if we do not think it is sustainable on a long-term basis. So that honest conversation leads to issues such as having low levels of employment and, low, and generally very low levels of manage, managerial experience means that you're bringing little industry experience to the startup which would be unusual for an entrepreneur. There may also be difficulties in you know, with mobility and accessibility, which would mean that meeting customers or networking can be much more challenging for some people with disabilities. There's also great difficulty in terms of getting startup capital, simply because the credit rating for many people with a disability is quite poor. The reason it's poor is because the difficulty in securing a job, even if they do get a job, the rates of pay are quite high or quite poor. In addition to that, um, people have additional costs due to the nature of their disability, which altogether means that they have lower levels of disposable income and much lower levels of savings, both of which means they're highly likely to have poor credit rating and therefore will have great difficulty in securing a startup loan. The biggest barrier by a distance is the fear of losing regular benefit um, income, social welfare benefit. And the loss of these supports is known as the welfare benefit trap. And this does not only apply to Ireland, but this is an international phenomenon whereby people make an economic decision that the secure income I am receiving through disability supports is much better to have than the uncertain income from being self-employed. Now the self, you know, the uncertain income could be much higher than the money currently being made, but Obviously, the risk also exists that it could be much lower. 
So people are unwilling to take the risk of losing their social welfare support. And one of the things we do on the course is we have a speaker from the Department of Social Protection who talks through what benefits you would be in, you would be entitled to if you start your own business and which ones you might be in danger of losing. And then it's up for, to each individual to make their own decision about what is best for them in their situation. Another barrier, as previously mentioned, is that support agencies do not understand the distinctive challenges faced by people with disability. Um, sorry, I'm just pausing for a moment because I realize that. Um, okay, Stephen, I'll come back to your question uh, at the end. Uh, is it understand what you're saying there? And we, I'll come back to it later. Um, so there's also then, as I mentioned earlier, the lack of access to appropriate training and appropriate support. What exists currently is that what's available to the general population. So enterprise agencies will tell us that our door is open to everyone. We treat everyone the same. And therefore people with disabilities should access those supports that are widely available. Unfortunately, what that means is that they fail to recognize the additional and distinctive challenges that I talked about earlier. Okay, they fail to recognize you know, the barriers to self-employment that I've just highlighted for, highlighted for you there. Uh, <clears throat> so this continues to be a, a, a big issue in Ireland and one that I know several people within the community are trying to change, but unfortunately nothing has happened yet. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink of water because I just got some cut in my throat. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving on from that, here's the course structure okay, on the, and I'm presenting this on the left hand side of the screen. And the course structure has 12 classes. Each of them take place Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m to our class, it's online. The, it, it begins on this year on September 20th, I think. Just confirm that because I just want to remember if that's the correct Wednesday. It's, um, so yes, Wednesday 20th of September is when it starts and it runs for 12 consecutive Wednesdays. In week one, there's the general introduction, and then we go through ID, idea generation and evaluation, customer segmentation, customer relationships and channels, clarifying the value proposition, balancing business and personal well being. That was an item we introduced last year and was really well received because there is no business if you're not looking after yourself properly. We also look at key business activities, key resources and partners, developing financial projections, test marketing your idea, understanding legal matters, and then finally bringing it all together. Each week, there is lecture content provided by Dennis Kennedy, who is the lecturer on the course. Dennis was a participant on the first program, the pilot program. And from it, he set up his own business doing delivering disability awareness training to large companies. So because of his experience of someone with disability, because of his experience as a trainer, because of his experience as someone who is self-employed, we thought he would be highly appropriate to deliver the program instead of 
someone like myself who doesn't come from the community. Each week from 11 to 12, there is lecture content on the specific topic of that day. Then from 12 to 12.30, we have a guest speaker. And the guest speaker is an entrepreneur with a disability. So we've had some really famous uh, people talk to the class, such as Sean Gallagher, uh, Mark Pollock, uh, and you know, a range of other speakers, some from abroad, uh, who talk about uh, their experiences starting a business uh, you know, while having a disability. Uh, one of the speakers is Debbie Adams from Canada, who each year supports our work by talking about her experiences and starting up her own business. We are very fortunate to be supported by some great organizations. Uh, in addition to AIB and ODI, the local enterprise offices provide business mentors for the program. So every person on the program will get their own business mentor who will work with them on the development of their business plan. We also use an online learning tool called SimVenture Validate. And basically that's a business planning tool. And each week <clears throat> you will be asked a series of questions on, you will be given access to this tool at the beginning of the course. And each week you will be given a requirement to complete a number of questions. By answering these questions, you are in effect building your business plan on a week by week basis so that by the end of the 12 weeks, your plan is effectively written for you. It's a superb online tool that we use. And because the course is funded, there is no cost to you. Also, I should make note, there is no cost to you in terms of fees, student fees, because of the funding received from AIB. Uh, we also have great supporters in terms of the sensory brand that I've got, Do Learn Finance there. It's actually Do the Financials. And it's an online tool to help you create your own financial projections. We've got Disability Federation of Ireland supporting us. They're providing promotional support, particularly at the moment as we're creating uh, awareness of the uh, course and the and we're seeking applications for us. And then, as I said earlier, we got guest speakers each week. I forgot to mention that from 12.30 to one o'clock, we also have a guest speaker and that guest speaker is an expert on the topic that we would have discussed that day or on a topic that we think to be highly relevant to the course. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a speaker from the Department of Social Protection. They would you know, deliver their talk between 12, 30 and 1. Someone from the local enterprise offices talk about what they offer and that's between 12, 30 and 1. So each Wednesday for one hour does class, half an hour does then a talk from an entrepreneur with a disability and then a half hour talk from someone who's got a specific expert that's of benefit or interest to the course participants. This is the structure of the business plan. This is a, a, a screenshot that I've taken from um, the uh, business model canvas. Uh, it's from SimVenture Validate. So this is kind of what it begins to look like as you start to fill it in. So you can, you know, I, I better describe this. Uh, it, it, there's basically 10 pillars to the business model canvas and there's customer segments get you know get keep grow channels value proposition uh key partners key activity key resources cost sustainability and revenue are the 10 pillars there are a series of questions within those that um, are completed and then the page starts to become to look like you know um, a, a brief overview of what 
what's been done, but underneath is much greater detail. So the point I want to make here is that the tool we use is extraordinarily simple. Uh, it's easy to follow. It allows you to build a business plan on a week by week basis. So there's nothing there that will overwhelm anyone in terms of the need to develop a full blown business plan two weeks before the end of course. That's not going to happen. In addition to that, there are four assignments, but the, the assignments are related to the development of the business plan. So as you complete the assignments, you are at the same time, okay, um, you know, developing your business plan and it all knits together at the very end. As I mentioned earlier, we had two courses. The first one was a course pilot and then uh, last year we had um, the first one paid by or funded by AIB. We only take a maximum of 20 participants and that's because we have 20 mentors or we have enough mentors for 20 people and we can't extend it any further. Also, we want to keep it um, nice and tight in terms of how we support people. And in the first two years, we've had you know, between 34 and 38 applications of people who self-identify as having a, a disability. So we're not looking for proof and the nature of the disability you know, is irrelevant. Um, so it's people who self-identify as having a disability. And we do our assessment of who should be offered a place based solely on the proposed business idea. I'll come to that in a moment. The nature of the disabilities, you know, on the first two programs, you know, varied widely. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 without getting into the detail of any of them, all I would say is that it was physical, mental, cognitive, emotional, you know, whatever terms you wish to use in the broad categorization. Uh, but the nature varied, you know, really, really broadly. And so there is no um, attempt by us to focus it on any particular category of disability. And so far, the marketplace has responded by being quite varied. Uh, it, the course itself is accredited by TU Dublin as a continuing professional development course. It's at level six. And if you successfully complete it, you will get five ECTS credits on their own. Obviously, it's not enough to get your qualification, but you may be taking qualifications elsewhere. And this will add to your list of uh, credits uh, that you've gained at level six. The use of role models, particularly successful entrepreneurs with a disability, is hugely successful. It's been the outstanding element of the course, according to uh, previous course participants, because it gives them a pathway. It gives them confidence that they can become an entrepreneur because others have done it before them. As students of DIT, because you will become a formally registered student of DIT, and that allows you to access all support, student support services. Uh, and particularly that would include our disability support services that are very strong and, and yeah, supportive of, of you and, and the course that we're running. Uh, indeed, I had a meeting with them just yesterday to discuss plans for the year ahead and how they can further enhance their services to our course participants. So they're hugely supportive. Each lecture is recorded and that allows people to watch it at home again in a time and space that best suits their needs. Or if people miss a lecture because of health appointment, for example, then they can catch up by simply going into our course website 
uh, we have a dedicated uh, website area that allows people to go in, look at the recording and gather other resources that we make available to people. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the course concluded with participants pitching their ideas to a panel of, we call them dragons, but it's an evaluation panel. And on both courses, six people indicated that they were intending to start their own business. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, one of the big highlights from it all is that almost everyone said they had developed their self-esteem and boosted their prospects of employment, uh, even if they weren't going to start their own business. So those are all the positives. Uh, for further details and registration, if you just go to our web page, which has all the details that I've, I've discussed, um, it's also got the uh, registration link at the bottom of the page that allows you to submit a registration. We are only interested in people who have a business idea. Um, if, you've, if you're already started, that doesn't really work for us because the focus of our attention is on pre-startup, not post-startup. Um, so therefore, the content of the course wouldn't be suitable for you. Additionally, if you do not have a business idea, it wouldn't be appropriate. Um, the course would not be appropriate because we need people who already have a business idea and they're just looking for a supportive and positive environment to undertake the assessment or viability of the course itself. So those are the um, the feedback. And what I'm now going to do is just take you into the screen, which I hope you can see with the page where all the information can be gathered. And at the bottom of the page, there is a link. And if you fill in that link, it's, it's you know it's quite short, um, but there is 500 words required to explain your business idea. And that's where we make it, our decision. So what we're looking for is people who have a business idea, but have not already started. And then they explain what their business idea is, who the target market is. Excuse me, I put the sneeze, sorry. And then I got some questions here. Are you starting business on your own or with co-founders? What is the product or service? What problem is your product or service solving? Who will buy it? Why is your product or service better than what is already available? And those are the questions that we are asking you to answer regarding your business idea. So I'm going to stop sharing now the screen and I'm happy to take questions either by audio or uh, in the, through the chat room. Uh, and if people want to come back and ask me questions, I'm quite happy to take um, questions from them. Stephen, you might want to finish your question and then we can take it from there. Stephen has raised his hand. Okay. So Stephen, yeah, happy Hi. to take your question. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And um, yeah, my so my uh, question, I'm not sure where I fit based on what you've just said, uh, because I do have a business idea. Uh, I haven't technically started the business, but um, it's a very sort of niche business. And it, there is, I know that I already work in the area specifically, it's with animals, with cats in particular. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, I do know the viability of the business. The, the, the parts that I really don't know and I think are my biggest challenge are how am I going to be able to manage doing that work uh, to a sustainable point, to a sustainable degree, um, and manage my own burnout uh, at the same time. Uh, so without like, you know, to make, yeah. So my that's sort of where my challenge is and where the disability 
element comes in because this is why I am being want to go into self-employment because the the sort of way that I need to work and things that I want to do are not available in like the wider workforce. Um, and uh, yeah, so is it like, the business isn't technically started, but it is, I'm, I'm in training for, I'm in a training course at the moment to complete that. And uh, yeah, I'm just sort of wondering where that kind of sits. Is that in the middle of? Stephen, the training course, is it a start your own business training course? It's a grooming, it's a, it's a grooming, it's a dog grooming course specifically. Oh, okay, um, okay. It yeah, covers so starting a, like managing a salon, but it doesn't, that's not the business I'm starting, if that makes sense. So, yeah. it, um, I, would say, I would say, I would say there would be no problem in you applying for this course, given that you've not started and that you've not taken a self employment course. And this course starts in September, is that right? And, Correct. And it wouldn't, I mean, between now and September, it's possible that I might start taking clients as a trainee. We could live not. with that. <laughs> so it's not, uh, okay, yeah, that makes, that's a bit clear, okay. And in terms of understanding burnout or potential burnout, that's why we have lecture six about balancing your know, business and personal well-being. Um, because that was an issue that came up in in the pilot program that we, we felt was important to address. And indeed, one of the speakers on, on that lecture uh, has a slide that it says, you know, you are not your business. Mm -hmm. um, and that notion of separating oneself from the business is hugely important, he would argue, um, to avoid burnout, as, as you rightly say. So we do address the issue of burnout and managing time and managing one's health um, in the course. And, yeah, because yeah. one of the things that I think about a lot is sort of being creative with the product of the business. Like there are things that I, for example, could do um, that would supplement the income and maybe allow me to do the work, the actual, I don't know if it, sorry, is that making sense? Like if in, in my case, just to be sort of specific, I'd be a cat groomer going into people's homes and grooming their cat at their home, right? Yeah. But I also do other work with cat, like uh, with, um, there's a, there's sort of, uh, there's a lot of other things there that could, that could be done that would require organization and planning, but less manual labor. Yeah. And well, part of what you'd be doing during the process is looking at revenue streams and looking at issues like, you know, what is it, what activities am I doing and where am I making money? And then how do I manage my time? And is all of this viable given, you know, the, 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 you know, the demands upon me? Um, and, I, you know, in, in the past, right, I'd say six people on average have started up, but are in 10 starting up, but like that means 14 don't because they come to realization that their business idea isn't viable or maybe self employment is not for them, but they've learned something else from it instead. So that's all part of the learning process for individuals who take the course. And to me, it sounds like it would be a good opportunity for you to reflect on all of those as well. Thank you. Thanks. So I would say apply, so as we're clear. I will, yes, thank you. Any other questions, folks? Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I think we've, uh, Bokeh? Okay. Hello. Hi, uh, go. If you want to go ahead with your question. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Great. Great. 
Uh, thank you so much for providing providing me this great opportunity and uh, to participate on this on this um, on this program. And um, I have ha I have some business ideas, and uh, I have not started. And speaking to you, I'm person with physical disabilities, and uh, who has not yet been employed in those sections and but want to get myself uh, into the into the self-employment sector. So um, I'm thinking about um, two separate type of business. One is a uh, car parts, selling car parts. And then um, the other is uh, selling uh, African food, food stuff, and you know, the not cooked food. And uh, where the, I'm going to get the African food and the uh, varieties of food and then uh, I'll open a shop uh, where people will come and buy. Yeah, and currently I live uh, around the century. I live in the Dublin Nine uh, Century Novel Park. And I have done a little survey in the entire uh, century area where my, my um, where I have moved around. I have not actually seen <laughs> shop and uh, so uh, that had just been my thinking because many a time if someone wants to buy African food you have to go all the way city center and then to buy African food so uh, my assessment has captured that it may, there may be a need because of a lot of African food around here yeah okay two things on, on, on that okay mm -hmm. um, one is that on we just finished an online entrepreneurship course for for migrants um, and restaurants and food shops is is very popular right and already there are quite a number of these stores available across the country right and the only work if there is big enough customer base for them right um, so if you've identified okay in dublin nine as an example that there is a store possibility because it means you don't have to go into the city center it, that would depend on how many people within your catchment area, okay? If you drew a circle around the shop, right, for a mile or two miles, okay, how many people from Africa actually live within that radius, right? And would they prefer to go to your shop rather than going to town? Uh, and if the number of people within that space isn't terribly big, then you know how viable is your business? So people might want you know people could go into into the city center, or they might go the other direction, okay, out into I don't know Blanchestown or something like that, where we say there's a large African community. So the because there's nothing in your area doesn't mean that there's a market for it. Um, as, as I frequently say to people, there might be a gap in the market, i.e. an opportunity, but is there a market in the gap? I.e. is it big enough for you to survive and make a living from it? And my experience with um, cultural food stores or international food stores and international restaurants is that the demand usually is not big enough to sustain them on an ongoing basis. Now, there is a way around that, which, you know, immigrant food stores are not working towards, right? And, and I've spent many years trying to change this but it's my experience that you know international food stores 
make little attempt to attract Irish customers into their store. Right? And if you're looking to broaden your appeal, right? if you're looking to make your business more sustainable, then it's not just the African community that you might be targeting, but also the Irish community. So someone like, like I love cooking food. I love cooking food from different countries, right? So I go all of my way to explore and find, you know, food, you know, stores that sell food that I want to cook relating to different cultures. Now, that might be unusual, but, but and there's others like me. But people don't make any effort to to make it enticing for me to go into their store okay, and to buy from them. It's basically, you know, this is an African store and that's all we're interested in. Um, so if you're looking to broaden your appeal, I, I, I'd, I'd urge you to think about that. But the failure rate for immigrant food stores, immigrant restaurants is really, really high. Uh, and you would need to be very clear in terms of A, what you're offering, and B, the size of your market, uh, if you were to go with that particular idea. So maybe the other idea might be, might have more uh, attraction to it in terms of long-term viability. Um, those are just my initial thoughts based on past experience. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just a little clarity. Um, it is not actually a restaurant. It is um, you going to buy and go and cook for yourself. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, what I'm saying is that it, it applies to both, right? I was saying food stores and restaurants. You know, uh, both of them have become hugely popular in terms oh. of startups but equally both food stores and restaurants um are, have really high failure rates okay yeah so um, i think i will have to continue exploring on the more ideas and uh, develop more ideas and see um what better suit our mind mind ability yeah, because I know with the immigrant program, we had quite a number of people with ideas around food stores and and restaurants, and we just rejected I think, oh, most yeah. of them because we because there wasn't enough information being given to explain why this one might succeed, where whereas you know a high percentage of others have failed. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Happy to take any. Uh, uh, Anna? Sorry. Oh. In terms of Michael's question, are there types of businesses that you especially like to see? The answer, um, Michael, is, is no. Uh, we have no preferred um, types of businesses. Um, the, the, I suppose the ones that we get, the ones that we kind of feel less inclined to support are um, apps because there's just millions of apps. And, and so unless you're, unless you're clearly explaining why this is different and how you can market it and, and create awareness about the app, given that it's such a crowded market space, then you know you need to explain that in your application if you were to look at an app. And then as I've just said, uh, in response to the last question, food stores, particularly immigrant food stores and immigrant restaurants, are ones that are less likely to be successful because they're really crowded markets. So what we're looking for is, you know, ideas that are, relative, you, know, so, you know, either innovative or offer benefits that 
cannot be found elsewhere or serve some sort of need that uh, uh, you know that's likely to have value um, to, to to potential customers. Um, the, quite a number of the successful businesses that have started in the past are based on ideas that um, through people's own experiences of disability. Um, so, for example, last year, one of the startup ideas that um, is likely to happen was on creating um, clothes that were more accessible for people with disability in terms of buttons, in terms of zips, in terms of how they were designed. Um, another one was an online clothes store that targeted people with disability. Um, so they were based on needs within the community uh, and, and a gap with potential, uh, with serious market potential was shown to exist with these business ideas. So that's what we're looking for, Michael, as opposed to um, yeah, food stores and, and apps. I'm not, I'm not discounting them, so as we're clear, uh, but you need to be really clear with those ones as to why they're different to anybody else. Uh, Anna, sorry, you were hand up for a question. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. But maybe you have already answered, but maybe just want to double check. Uh, and would you consider like small service providers? So let's say because you mentioned that the person who is facilitating the, the training, he himself was a, a participant and his business is around the training, right? So my, yeah. because, because I'm more inclined towards uh, coaching specific groups of uh, people with disabilities. So maybe developing a more comprehensive kind of coaching practice with others and stuff like that. Is that something that might be eligible or that's kind of too small? Or No, no, no. Any, anything is eligible, right? So anything is eligible. We're open to all ideas. We're open to all kind of suggestions. Um, any kind of self-employment. So the notion of coaching or training of, you know, and it could be particular, you know, we said Dennis was training companies around disability awareness, but we've also had people providing um, therapy to people with disabilities, providing um, um, uh, like a nationwide, uh, that night we were featured, the startup that got, that was shown was where um, one of the people in the first program set up a gym that is uh, customized fitted for people with disability and he's he's his clients are people with disability and he designs and works with them on individual training programs around strength and conditioning you know that fits with their um their requirements to uh, maintain a healthy uh, and your know, physical fitness regime. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you wanted to identify or if you identified a need where you would be self-employed and coaching and, you know, there's opportunity there, yeah, that's perfectly fine. No problem. Thank you. And Anna, just to let you know, is that if you want to set up a social enterprise, that's perfectly fine too. Actually, the winner of last year's Dragons then pitching event um, set up a social enterprise targeted at um, the neurodiverse community. Uh, so, social enterprise, absolutely, no problem. Any other queries? No. Everybody's happy. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, hand back to you. Thanks, thanks, Tom. And Julian, I think your your question there was just answered as well with regards to the, the social enterprise. So that's perfect. Um, yeah. Well, Tom, thank, thanks so much for for that for your presentation and all the 
the information about it. it it's really, it, it's great to hear more, the more information, the more detail about what's being done and, and how, you know, I suppose all the, all the extra consideration and effort that's gone into to making it, you know, as relevant, as, as specific for people with disabilities as, as possible. And certainly I just, I think the, having so many people involved in it, delivering the course, having the, the entrepreneurs, the speakers, everybody with the, the lived experiences is hugely invaluable and um, is really, really exciting to, to hear about. So I hope, um, it, I'm sure it's been real value for everybody here today. Um, and, and thanks so much um, for, your, for your time speak, and, speaking to us. Patrick, what I've just done there, right, is I've just put in to answer, um, uh, it was answering Anna's final comment there. It's fantastic, such programs exist. Thanks a lot for doing this. But what I did was I added in the link to the web page that has all the information plus the um, plus the application form at the end of that page. And Perfect. it's also got my email address if people have any follow up uh, inquiries so people can email me if they've got any further questions. Um, but the link will provide the application form, additional information and my email address. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And for everybody, um, if you can access that link, now, do feel, feel free to, to copy in and, and take it away. If not, we will include it in the, the follow-up mail going out with the link to, to re the recording here today. Um, so I hope you've all found it really insightful, interesting, and helpful. I um, would encourage as many of you as possible who, who have an idea and are interested in, in pursuing something in entrepreneurship to, to explore and, and, and potentially apply for, for the course. And um, if there are any other questions or thoughts or ideas, um, feel free to, to follow up again um, uh, on that. We'll, we'll hopefully also be back um, next month with another date for, for another session. Um, if there is anyone who wants to maybe, if you've worked on some ideas, maybe you might want to bring them and, and raise them like some people have done here today, or just to get a refresher on the, on the course, maybe you might be making a final decision on whether or not to, to sign up. Um, but we hope you do. Um, and thank you all for signing up today and being with us. So um, much appreciated. Um, hope you all have a chance now to enjoy the, the rest of the evening. That it's it's sunny where you are. And um, thanks thanks again, everybody. And we will talk to you soon.